The Behemoth Brewing Company presents the Department of Conversation with Pat Brittenden. Behemoth, give me something hoppy. Uh, Professor of Public Health, Professor Michael Baker, uh, epidemiologist, and one of the faces we've grown to know, trust and love over this whole COVID (laughs) crisis time. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for giving us a few minutes today. Just to have a bit of a chat. Hi. (laughs) Hey, kia ora, Pat. And kia ora to you. Based in Wellington, you're in Wellington at the moment? That's right. I'm at an outpost of the University of Otago, the clinical school in Wellington. It's funny, eh, because being, me being located in Dunedin, I often connect with people from the university, and probably the first time I saw your name or wanted to connect with you, I was like, oh, you should come in for a chat. And I think you said to me on email, <laughs> I'm in Wellington. I'm like, oh, that's right. There's a, okay, I'm, I've am i got that sorted out. Hey, um, the reason I really wanted to connect, it's a bit of a, I'm a little bit embarrassed about the story that I'm about to tell you, but it's the it's the genesis of this conversation is that I was watching um, the breakdown on Sky TV. For those who don't know, the breakdown is a rugby uh, program where they all sit around and talk about rugby. You know, Sir John Kerwin's on there and uh, Goldie, Jeff Smith and some other guys as well. And they started talking about COVID in South Africa because the Lions are currently touring there. And then JK started talking about COVID currently in Italy because his family's there. And two days ago, my father was talking to me about COVID in Fiji uh, because we've always, as a family, had a, an affinity and a quite a close connection to Fiji. And then in the news at the moment, we're hearing about COVID. Um, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to exaggerate, but it's sort of exploding. I don't know what the right word is. Increasing in Australia, and I just had this little epiphany which was oh my goodness this is still really serious and we're sitting in our little well I'll say I'll sit in my little bubble in Dunedin and New Zealand feeling quite safe and not really worrying too much about it yet it feels like we're on this is what I said to my to you in my email it feels like from what I'm seeing and reading and hearing that we're on a bit of a precipice where vaccinations are rolling out what feel like incredibly slowly 10% 10% of New Zealand is fully vaccinated when we started five months ago. Um, and we feel like we're on a precipice of vaccinations are coming, but actually there's outbreaks all over the world as well. And I just kind of wanted to touch base and ask you about it. And I don't know, maybe I want you to stroke my head and make me feel better or something, if you can do that. <laughs> yeah, well, look, the world is very diverse in terms of where the pandemic is at. I mean, firstly... More people have died this year, and we're only halfway through, than all of last year and in in across the globe. So for many countries, the pandemic is only getting worse, and that's the trajectory it's on. Uh, and that's because, as you point out, there are more infectious variants. The Delta variant will work our way through the Greek alphabet over time. And also, vaccines have been um, uh, used or, or obtained by high income countries who are right at the front of the queue and most of the world's population only a tiny minority so far are fully vaccinated so the world is um, even more unequal this year than it was last year and unfortunately um, in many countries around the globe in low and middle income countries they're going to see very intense transmission and many more fatalities and the other inequality is of course is that they're doing far less testing. And the only way you count it as a case is if you test positive. Right. And if you die from this infection, you have to be, have been confirmed as a case. So the true mortality, I mean, the recorded mortality is about 4 million. The true mortality will be maybe 12 million, maybe more. Um, And particularly if you look at um, the number who are known to have died in a place like um, Peru currently has the highest cumulative mortality, it's about 0.6% of the population. More than half a percent of all the people in Peru have now died from this infection, and the pandemic is still going. So that that dwarfs the the mortality, and even countries have been badly affected, like the UK and the US. Um, I don't know how much of this you can sort of comment on, because you're in a, as someone who is a professor of public health, I'm not saying you have a political position, but obviously people listen to you and people hear what you say. So I might say some things that if you can't respond to, please feel free to say you can't respond to that. But but I was equally interested that you're talking about the rich countries getting the vaccine. And for people who are watching this, 
I'm showing a map right now of Africa. And if I scroll around Africa, Chad, less than 0.1% have been fully vaccinated. Niger, uh, 0.3% have been fully vaccinated. Mali is 0.2%. Republic of Congo, 2.2%. Central African Republic, 1.7%. South Sudan, 0. Or less than 0.1% have been fully vaccinated. But then if we scroll around to, you know, arguably that one of the countries that did the worst for the rest of the world, being the US, with COVID, 48.5% have been fully vaccinated and 56.1% have received at least one dose. I guess that's kind of what you're saying about the wealthy countries have got to the front of the queue and the poorer countries are now having to fend for themselves. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And also it's partly related to where the vaccines are produced and um, the fact that um, the, the major manufacturers are in North America and Europe. Um, those countries have funded the, the, the development of these vaccines and their production. And um, their populations, I, I guess, expect to get the, the result of that investment. But that, um, again, it goes against the principles being promoted by the World Health Organization and the COVAX scheme, which is designed to promote vaccine equity. Um, but it is, um, to some extent, I think, a losing battle um, to get vaccines to lower middle income countries in the short term. I think by sometime next year, the world will have a huge uh, vaccine production capacity um, and we will see vaccines being supplied across the globe, but unfortunately not this year. Is there more danger, and let's just pick Malawi just because it comes to mind, we've just you know talked about the 1% fully vaccinated, is there more danger uh, in the community in Malawi than there would be, for example, in the community of San Francisco? Like, is there any more danger in the areas that are also not getting the vaccination? I guess what I'm asking is, not because they're not getting the vaccination, but just from the virus in general? Or is everyone sort of under the same risk? So uh, applying the vaccination to one country over another based on risk, there's no preference. Yeah, look, it's very complicated because risk rises hugely with, with increasing age. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why the average mortality is much lower in many low-income countries because they have a younger age structure. Right. And typically um, countries in Europe, North America that have been good at, at keeping older people alive for longer have a lot more vulnerable older people. So at a, a population level, the overall mortality is around, from the virus is around um, 1% or a bit more in a lot of these high-income countries. Um, and um, that's the infection mortality risk. Um, and, and whereas in, um, uh, because of the low age structure, it might be 0.2% in, in some low income countries with, with youthful populations. I mean, that's just a bit of a quirk. Mm. The risk is still higher for your average older person living in Chad probably compared with California, just because people have a number of other, they may have a number, number of other serious chronic illnesses in um, low-income countries for the for people of the same age group. Um, I'm interested as well, maybe you could clear this up for me. I heard someone talking the other day, and I have to plead ignorance as to who it was, don't know whether they were an expert or not, which is, you're an expert, so I'll ask you. Is it true that um, as a virus mutates, it becomes typically less harmful? The example that was given is a, a virus's job is to you know find a host and if the virus kills all its hosts, it's not really doing what it's supposed to do. So when it mutates, it t typically becomes less harmful, easier to catch, but less harmful. Is that, am I spinning or is that, that there any accuracy to that? And if it is the case, what does that mean about the Delta one? Is it easy to catch, but not as serious as the original strain or not? Mm. That's a great question. And this is this whole area of um, evolutionary biology. And um, I used, to, you know, the, the points you made is what I understood until, you, you know, I got a little bit more aware of um, what the, um, the, of the literature in this area. You're absolutely right on one point that there's huge selective benefits for any virus that is more infectious, simply because it makes more copies of itself, it produces more offspring, if you like, and therefore that, that tray that gives it the advantage becomes more common. 
And so what we're seeing over time, as we're working through the Greek alphabet, uh, we've seen more, all these variants that are thriving are the more infectious ones. They take over. We had alpha, the English version early on, and then more recently Delta that first appeared in India has become dominant. And we'll see more of that. That's just the way of the world. The other question about whether they become more benign or more dangerous is more complicated. Basically, it doesn't make much difference for the virus, in fact. And so there's very little advantage uh, or selective pressure in favor of more benign viruses over time. So unfortunately, there's no guarantees. And I remember reading about this and it pointed out that smallpox has never become, despite hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years of being possibly the biggest single killer in history for infectious diseases, it never got any more benign over time, right. despite a vast amount of, as we say, passages through humans. And that actually unfortunately appears to be the case in general with viruses. The other thing that goes on is um, it's debated a great deal is whether the virus will get better at evading immune protection because um, vaccines give you um, uh, protection against um, the virus, but it might be that some of the viruses that can escape that immune protection will be, will be selected for. And I think that's quite likely, but there is a question of whether they talk about the peak fitness for a virus it's quite complicated. It may be that it will never get ahead of all of our vaccines. I, and I tend to think the vaccines will win, but it's still, we don't know. This is one of those things you don't know till you try it. Because at a population level, the virus still has surprises, I think, for us. So what I hear you saying is it's not a rule. You used uh, smallpox, this is an example. It's not a rule that it gets weaker. So I guess the next natural question would be, is this in this particular instance does the delta virus appear to be more benign than the alpha yeah again um i think it's quite hard to know um occasionally you get early stories suggesting um firstly it's more infectious and that i think is almost a given if it's taking over if it's coming dominant that's because it's more infectious than the other ones now, um, the evidence that they're more harmful, even that they have different symptoms, is often talked about, but I think you really want to wait for high quality studies because it's easy for biases to come in when they're looking at, um, at they're making comparisons. So I'm always, I always hold back on making any conclusions that the virus has changed in other ways because there isn't really much, much in it for the virus as a rule. And I guess that's the, as the um, Professor of Public Health I don't want you to say anything that might be picked up by other media or construed as a decision when we don't know yet. So that perfect, yeah. got it, and, and with you. Um, how do you think New Zealand's currently going with our vaccination program? When I read that 10% of the population has been fully vaccinated and the first vaccinations happened in Dunedin on about the 18th of February, so what's that, March, April, May, June, July, so it's been five months. Um, do you think it's a, a, a good marker? or it, it feels to me like 10% is not very much, but I'm not in the industry to understand and know. How do you feel about New Zealand being at 10% fully vaccinated? And uh, is it where we should be or should we be further down the track? I think it'd be nice to be further down the track, but um, I think there are uh, also benefits in not being the first um, to have high coverage. Um, one is we can learn about the, I mean, firstly, because we've succeeded with elimination, we don't have circulating virus. People are not dying every day. Um, or no one's dying from it, which is a huge relief. Um, and uh, so our need is less than many other countries where the vaccine is currently going. Uh, so from a global equity point of view, I think New Zealanders, it may not feel like it, but I think we can say we are doing something for global equity by because we don't need the vaccine at, as in a desperate way like many other countries. So I think that's a positive. There are other positives too. I mean, we can learn from how the vaccine is being rolled out overseas if there are any unexpected adverse events and there aren't with um, the vaccines. They appear exceptionally safe, but we uh, can be reassured about that. Um, there are some more theoretical benefits. We can potentially space our vaccines further apart um, and get um, an even bigger immune um, uh, rise um, uh, of um, antibody rise from 
um, the vaccine. I mean, we're not necessarily taking advantage of that, um, but um, it's not a it's not a bad thing in our case. The other thing is, since we are prioritising the vaccines to reach the most vulnerable groups, um, we have. Um, just about completion of, of our of vaccination of our border workers, which is obviously great. And also if we can finish with priority group two, the healthcare workers in group three, the most vulnerable, then we are, we do have a lot of protection should we get an outbreak in terms of a reduced impact on our population. So I think um, uh, for all those reasons, I'm not overly concerned about where we are uh, where we're at at the moment with our vaccine rollout. And even in the way we're going, we'll have our whole population fully vaccinated with a, a very effective safe vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, by the end of the year. Pfizer's been very reliable at delivering the vaccines when it says it will, and um, so far it has done that. Uh, and if we do that, by the end of the year, we will still be amongst the most privileged populations in the world in terms of having high coverage at that point. So I'm, you know, overall I'm I'm quite positive about where we're at at the moment. Is that everybody vaccinated? Everybody, everybody, like including, um, you know, children and that who who weren't getting vaccinated? Because it feels like you're saying by the end of the year, and as you say that, I look at my calendar saying July, so that's five months or the end of the year to do the other ninety percent of the population. Are we literally talking anybody or just the adult population who need it? Well, I would say at the moment we're talking about the population uh, down to um, uh, certainly to 14 year olds um, because we've got approval well, actually down to I think maybe 13 year olds because the vaccine was originally um, I think 17 year olds and above and now we've got approval to go four years below that I think that's 16. at least down to 13 year olds I just have to check um, that approval has been given pr provisionally so um, that's, um, uh, I think, a realistic expectation. Now, ideally, we will go lower than that. Um, if you want to have a chance at getting a reasonable degree of population protection, you really want to vaccinate down to six months of age. Wow. Um, and we would expect that to be, again, effective and safe. Um, those studies are, uh, I think, about to um, be completed overseas. And remembering most vaccines in New Zealand are given to young children, infants down to six weeks of age. So that is just the normal um, pr approach. And what they will be doing now is they're going to be using lower, um, you need less of the vaccine antigen, so um, less um, vaccines needed in these younger age groups, obviously, because their, their, their mass is smaller of children. Also, they have extremely active immune systems. So they will, will respond very vigorously to um, this vaccine and, and mount a, um, a large antibody response. And I think that um, vaccinating, those, vaccinating these young kids will ultimately give us a chance of getting close to population protection. Mm. Uh, so what I hear you saying is, um, I don't know, as a target, as an, as an expectation, as a hope, maybe secondary school students and up by the end of the year. Would be a would be a good thing to aim for. Yeah, I think so. I think that's realistic. Uh, we might get some. Uh, we might find that the second doses for some of them have to be given next year. Right. But um, I, I, you know, I think that's very much the government's committed to doing that, and uh, they've got good plans for that. Um, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we're an advocate quite near the start of the stamp out, you know, stamp it out action rather than the flatten the curve. Am I correct in in that conversation? Yes, yeah. very much so. On reflection, looking back, I mean, I don't mean to ask an obvious question, but I'm thinking, uh, you know, it seems that some countries that flatten the curve might have been getting back to their economy more quickly than we have or getting back to daily life a bit more post-COVID. We haven't really had COVID. On reflection, do you still think it was 100% the right decision to make, the, the stomp out rather than flatten? Absolutely. I mean, all of the indicators, are, all the metrics suggest it was the optimal approach. Um, New Zealand has by far the lowest COVID-19 mortality in the OECD by a big margin. Uh, we have had, according to all the indicators, show that we've had a higher level of freedom over this whole period 
that's the Oxford stringency index. And also a new one for me was the Economist magazine normalcy index. I'd never heard of it before, but it's just come out, which is, uses eight indicators of um, returning to normal activities like being able to go to watch a movie with your friends, go out for dinner, just attend work in a normal way. And we are, the again, right at the top of the scale along with Hong Kong, which has also pursued elimination. So, and the third area is economic performance. And um, our GDP has recovered higher, more rapidly than average for the OECD and unemployment is lower. So by every indicator, New Zealand has had um, probably the best, um, most effective response of any country. And if we look at um, a country that um, we work, that some people said we should follow Sweden, and that's having a light touch. If we'd followed them, we would have had uh, about 8,000 deaths from COVID-19 by mm. now. We also had another unexpected benefit in New Zealand, and that was that excess winter mortality last year didn't happen. So instead of 2,000 people dying over winter, none of those 2,000 people appeared to have died, and they've lived through to this year. So we're about 10,000 lives ahead of where we would have been if we'd followed the lighter touch approach. And remember, most of those countries, none of them have returned to the level of freedom that New Zealand's enjoying. They're generally not having big stadium events, with the possible exception of um, uh, um, the UK, which has decided that it is just going to go headlong into Freedom Day, which Boris Johnson has said is coming up in about a week on the 19th of July. And many, I would say, all of the public health people I know in the UK and medical people I know are horrified because um, this is looking like um, a very dangerous um, experiment because effectively it's going to allow around 10 million young people and children in the UK to get this infection. So it's, it's immunity by natural infection, which is um, uh, generally considered a very bad idea. Do you think we're at risk at all in New Zealand? Like, I guess I'm holding myself up as a bit of a bad example, but we are we at risk on mass of becoming complacent about this? Um, like I said, I didn't really think I haven't. I I had to go searching for the one o'clock briefing, you know, to find out where we were up to. Whereas in that lockdown period, obviously the whole nation was tuning in every single day. Uh, even though yeah. my family has quite a, a close affiliation with Fiji, I didn't really know anything about it. And when I looked it up, I see that a, a month ago. Uh, Fiji had under a thousand cases for the whole time period, and a mm. month later they now have over ten thousand. I mean that's a horrific, you know, exponential growth in such a, a small country. Do you think we have a risk as Kiwis of being so complacent because you know the All Blacks were in Dunedin in the weekend and the stadium was pretty full? We're not even thinking about it. Uh, are we? Should we continue to think about it? Should we continue to? to act in certain ways because it is still out there. Yes, of course. Um, when one of the, um, that is one of the problems of our success is that people aren't uh, that conscious of this threat. And, you, you know, um, it's a bit of out of sight, out of mind um, at the moment, but you're right. I mean, we are only a few cases away from being Fiji. Uh, and um, we came that close three weeks ago in Wellington, when we had um, a traveler, as everyone knows from Sydney, who came to Wellington and did all the things they were encouraged to do and, and packed an amazing amount into a weekend. All these indoor activities, I mean, it was, a, you know, unusually for Wellington, it was a cold and wet winter's day and so everyone was packed indoors. And um, they went to, I think they managed to, to have 2,600 identifiable contacts in a weekend, which I think is a bit of a record for a single <laughs> person. And um, uh, and they were infectious because they infected their partner. It was a Delta variant. Um, it could have been a series of, of terrible super spreading um, episodes. Yeah. And it would have absolutely overwhelmed our contact tracing system. We would be straight into an intense level three, probably a level four lockdown for weeks to deal with that. I mean, we would have eventually controlled it, but it would have, affected many people it could have killed some people so that's the reminder and we have to keep uh, mentioning that to people but in the end it's a lot of it's about the go government 
keeping ahead of the pandemic and about the policy response. Um, I also think that, and I've said this all the way through because we've been doing this podcast now for over 18 months and often COVID comes up, we in New Zealand seem to have had a mix of good luck and good management. I mean, that, that didn't spread around to the 2,000 people as good luck, whereas the response to it is the good management. And if we didn't have good luck in one of these instances, maybe it would be a full, you know, level four lockdown for Wellington for four weeks or whatever, but we didn't have to go there, which I think is is, an, uh, is the lucky part of how we've done this. But then again, they say you make your own luck as well. Maybe that, that's a part of it. Hey, I was, I was interested to ask you as well about the international bubbles. Every time we seem to want to open up or do open up and, and say, well, let's go to Rarotonga or let's go to Australia, within a very short period of time, we're locking down again. Do you think international bubbles are actually a realistic or are we just trying to push a bit early for something that can't happen until really the world has us under control well um yeah look i'm i think you're partly correct in that it's um not easy to do what new zealand is doing now with australia and the cook islands and i think people in new zealand just forget that this is unique globally there are no other countries have formed a green zone of, of um, uh, uh, adjoining jur jurisdictions aiming for no transmission of the virus at all. People, they have had green corridors for months in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, but these are just countries that have relatively low transmission. Here we're aiming for no transmission at all. And despite what Scott Morrison says, there Australia has pursued the most intense elimination approach like New Zealand, and it's just got more intense. And um, they've halved the number of people coming into Australia for the foreseeable future. It's more like Fortress Australia now right. until they have a highly vaccinated population, which is actually, I think, makes it easier for New Zealand to sustain this green zone of Australia. Uh, they will bring their um, current outbreak in New South Wales under control. And um, I'm quite confident, confident of that uh, because they don't want circulating virus any more than we do. Mm. So I think we will return to quite a functional green zone we will have the occasional scare. We will have outbreaks, but we're actually getting quite good at managing them in, in all, of, all of these jurisdictions. Hey, since this has all started up, you know, beginning of last year, first quarter of last year, I'm wondering, has anything in your life changed day to day? And I'll give you an example. I haven't pushed a pin number since pre-COVID lockdown. So I've got my wallet's got like a little a finger ring on it that you can put your finger through. Every time I push a pin number, I use that. I haven't actually touched one since <laughs> since pre-lockdown is there anything in your life that's changed because of and you've kept on doing it through to you know today i i think the biggest change for me has been much more uh, meetings by zoom right or um, equivalent um that's a huge change i in the past i would have had maybe some we have a, a bit of a pattern in our apartment that, that people might have wednesdays to work at home and finish things in relative quiet. And uh, now I think um, it's more common that staff have days when they stay at home and work on things. And particularly if they have the slight, even the slightest hint of um, feeling a bit unwell, people will, will work from home. So I think that's the biggest single change. Otherwise, uh, uh, I think for me, just engaging with the media a great deal. And um, I've found, um, at times um, a bit harrowing, but also quite rewarding because I've, I've had that real feeling that we're all working together. I found the media to be very good, very much on your side. Uh, and uh, just the um, overall New Zealand's really pulled together, I think, in a way that has been astounding. And um, I'm also really positive about the reset potential from this event because I think it's reminded us about the benefits of collective action, that governments actually are important, that having the right government is, is makes a huge difference. And you look globally, governments are saving people and they're killing them on a grand scale, just as they have probably throughout history. But I think it's very obvious at the moment um, what's happening around the globe. And I, I think when we do do the final um, you know, calculus, if you like, on the pandemic, we will just see this huge correlation between um, benign governments that have put public health first, that have listened to evidence. Um, they've managed to 
um, get their, pull their populations through in much better shape than other governments, um, particularly authoritarian uh, uh, right-wing governments that are completely business-focused and have, have prioritised the health of their people um, lowly. Um, it's just more stark than it's ever been. Yeah. And unfortunately, global inequalities are getting worse throughout this event, and I think that's a concern. But again, on the positive side, um, I'd like to think that um, we can use the opportunity to strengthen multilateral agencies like the World Health Organization and just recognize that um, we are so interconnected globally, and that will give us, I think, some new tools for tackling much tougher problems like climate change. Uh, because um, a pandemic, even if it seems what is very intense, like the current pandemic, it is a uh, transitory event. We will get through it and we will return to something that will be different from how we used to live, but it will be, again, quite um, hopefully uh, many things will return to um, you know normal, particularly in terms of um, social interaction. Mm. But that's very different from climate change because climate change in some ways, it's a one-way trip. And once you um, build in the, this huge... Um, uh, load of um, greenhouse gases globally that will be there for decades, maybe centuries. Um, it, you know, we, it's irreversible, many of these changes. So the big lesson for me is we have to take, we have to learn from the COVID response and apply these lessons to these other threats on the horizon. Hmm. Um, have you got time for one more quick question? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a bit more of a controversial question, but I'd, I'd like to get your take on it as well. Um, there's parts of the world who are talking about the lab leak theory at the moment. I was going to play something. It's only 30 seconds. He's a comedian. I'm not putting too much value in him. But a lot of people look to John Stewart as quite a reliable source of news. He, he said this the other day. I, I, and I honestly mean this. I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to science. Science has in many ways helped ease uh, the suffering of this pandemic uh, which was more than likely caused by science. <laughs> so uh, John Stewart has gone all in on the lab leak theory, uh, saying that it's more than likely that this has come from the lab. At the start of this whole coronavirus, that was something that wasn't allowed to be said on internet sites. It would get your clips taken off YouTube. There seems to be a growing um, number of people who are saying that there's a good chance that this may have come from a lab. Uh, there's also the opposing happened. There's an article that I read the other day, I think on the RNZ website, 21 you know, researchers are coming out saying this is why it hasn't come from the lab and come from, that has come from nature. Do you have a, a thought of that or an opinion on that or a position? Yeah, um, look, I, I think some of the, there's some very good um, convincing articles I've read suggesting the lab leak um, hypothesis um, is quite plausible. So I'd, I'd personally like to keep an open mind on that. Uh, but I, I did read recently a piece, I think, by Eddie Holmes and co, who are very credible uh, virologists and evolutionary biologists. They had looked at the evidence, and I think they basically said that the what has always been the most likely um, theory is that it was a spillover event from an animal reservoir um, is almost certainly what has happened here, that the laboratory leak theory, we have to keep testing that, but it's not looking um, likely. And I, I mean, I always go, like most people, I always think you start off with the most plausible and the simplest theory. And that is what we've seen with multiple other human pathogens. They've almost everything that infects humans has come from an animal reservoir at some time in the past. We've seen SARS, we've seen MERS, and now we've seen another coronavirus. Um, that appears to have come from an animal reservoir. Um, not every step in that process has been identified, but often it's very hard. I mean, even for Ebola, which has caused, I, I think, about 20 at least spillover events into humans, the exact source is still not known, despite intense efforts in Africa. Uh, so I, I think that's by far the most plausible source. But, um, you know, we need to, um, uh, it's just, I think, a reminder that um, some laboratory scientists um, have done um, research. They talk about this gain of function studies to see if they can 
make a virus more transmissible to prove a point about the risks that these viruses pose, I think we do need very intense scrutiny of that kind of research because at least one laboratory leak has occurred historically that has caused a global pandemic. It was not, um, it was in 1977, it was um, an influenza virus. Uh, so we know this can happen, um, but I don't, in this instance, I think the balance of the evidence is still very much on the zoonotic reservoir. Professor of Public Health uh, from the University of Otago, Professor Michael Baker, thanks for giving us some time today. Really do genuinely appreciate it. And um, yeah, pretty happy to be in New Zealand to have people like yourself and Susie Wiles and others um, kind of leading the way and keeping us informed as to what's going on. Feel pretty lucky and pretty blessed to be where we are. Well, great to talk, Pat. Thanks. Um, thanks for great questions. <laughs>